Hey everyone, in this video we're going to talk about one last graph problem, which is the traveling salesman problem. Now unlike the shortest path problem or the minimum spanning tree problem, this traveling salesman problem does not have an efficient solution. We will talk about the basically only solution, which is to, to sort of like do a brute force search for what we're looking for, and we'll explain what the complexity of this algorithm is and why it's so terrible. So the traveling salesman problem is uh, basically if you imagine the graph is a network of cities like the one we've been dealing with for instance and the goal of the traveling salesman is to visit all of those cities doing a tour so you would want to go to Richmond and Fredericksburg and Alexandria and Harrisonburg and all of the other places in the graph and stop at each city only one time and get back to his starting city and he wants to do this in the least amount of total time possible. So it doesn't maybe on the surface sound so very different from the shortest path problem or the minimum spanning tree problem, but it turns out that there's just no efficient way of doing this. The only way to really solve this problem is to just go through all of the different possible paths that he can take and as we'll see there's a really really a ton of them. So let's dive in and start talking about the traveling salesman problem. All right, so I have a new example graph here because the Virginia cities one actually turns out it's not possible to even find a, a, a proper tour through the cities because there's not quite enough edges. So here we have a sort of a simplified graph with only six nodes. And so, like I said, the traveling salesman problem is you have some traveling salesman and I guess this comes from the days when there was like door-to-door -door salesmen who would like travel around selling encyclopedias or vacuum cleaners or some kind of a thing. It's not really a thing anymore, but that's where the name of this problem comes from. And so the traveling salesman starts in one city and he wants to visit all of the cities and get back exactly where he came from and not have to visit the same city twice. So if he goes like from E to D to A, then back to D, that's not okay because then he'll have hit the same city twice. So instead, let's see if we can find a path through here. We can go E to D to A, then let's say he goes on to F and then B and then C and then E. That looks like it's one tour through those cities starting here and going like this through the cities in this order. So we can write it like this, E, D, A, F, B, C, and then it's implied he goes back to B. Well, it turns out this isn't the only tour through these cities. The salesman instead could go from E to B, then down to D here, then on to A and on to F, then on to C, and then from C back to E, like this. And so if you look at it, this is a different tour. They're using different edges. In the green option, we take this path here for 18 and this path here for 23, which are different. We don't do that in the orange path. In the orange path, instead, we take this 15 here and this 13 here. So if you look at it, the orange path is less total cost because instead of doing an 18 and a 23, we did a 13 and a 15. Is there another path that has an even better lesser cost than the orange one or the green one we found? Uh, we don't know, or I don't know anyway. Maybe there is, maybe there's not. And so that's the traveling salesman problem. How do you find a tour that hits all of the nodes in the graph like this and comes back for the least total cost? And so even though traveling salespeople are sort of a relic of the past, this problem is still an important one because it has other applications and sort of like planning and logistics problems. You know, if you're organizing like a uh, musical artist and they want to go on tour and visit different cities, you know, you have the same problem. And even if you don't think of the distance between the cities or the mileage as the main cost, it could be airline tickets and then you, you sort of have a similar problem. And so we would really like to be able to solve this problem, but unfortunately there isn't a good solution. Unlike the minimum spanning tree problem in which we had a greedy solution, if you remember, the greedy solution here falls apart. For instance, the greedy solution one we could propose is to simply take the next smallest edge that gets you to a new city. Let's see what happens when we do that. So let's say we start in city E again. Well, we'll see this is the least cost path that gets us to a new city, so let's take that one. Then we have the 31 or the 23. Let's take the 23 over here, which gets us to B. 
Then the least cost path that gets us to a new city is the 13 to A. If we take that one, we'll be over here. Then the new least cost path that gets us to a new city is the 29. And if we take that, we'll come down here to C. Now, if we take the next least cost path that gets us to a new city, it would be this 18 to F. And we've chosen good paths so far, but now we're kind of SOL because F does not connect up to any new city. There are, we've actually been to every new city. We need to go back to E, but there's no edge here from F to take us back to E. So if we do this greedy algorithm where we just take like the next best path available, we can get stuck in situations like this where there is no path back. And even if there was a path back, imagine there was one, but it was like super high cost. Let's say it had cost 250 then we would be able to take it and we would be able to complete a proper tour and get back to E, but it would not be the least cost path because we were forced to take this edge at the end, which has a really, really high cost. So this greedy solution breaks down. The only solution to this problem really is to try all of the possible paths, all of the possible orderings of these cities and see one, is this actually a viable path or are there like edges, edges missing? Like if we pick like A to E, that doesn't work. And likewise, what is the cost of this ordering and find the smallest one after we've rolled through all of them. And then we can think about that. How many possible orderings are there of these cities? Well, we'll take E as sort of like a fixed thing because we're always starting in E in all of the Scenarios here will say we start in E and we end back in E. So we really just need to order the other one, two, three, four, five cities. Well, one of them is doing them in order A, B, C, D, F. The next one we could imagine we swap the last two and we do A, B, C, F, D. Or we can say we do A, B, D, C, F, or A, B, C, F, D, or A, B, C, no, not C there. Um, instead, we'll do D, F, C, or we can do A, B, F, C, D, or A, B, F, D, C. Oops, and I accidentally did this one twice, so let's take that one out. So, so far we have one, two, three, four, five, six different orderings, and that's just with A and B here being constant. The question is, if we have these six cities, the question is how many different orderings are there? Well, in this case, if we sort of keep the E as a constant as our starting location, we have one, two, three, four, five other cities that can be arranged in any order. And if you remember from your discrete math, when we did combinatorics, you would know that the number of times you can order N items is N factorial. So there's five factorial ways that we can order these remaining five cities, which is 120. It might seem surprising that with this small of a graph, there's 120 different routes starting at E that could visit all of these cities and get back. And we have to check all of them to find which one is the lowest. So that's basically the algorithm. Find all of the orderings for the cities that you're given, compute the cost of that path. If it exists, if there's edges missing, you say that this is not a viable path. And after you run through all of them, you find the one with the smallest total weight, and that's your answer. So I have a program to do this. We have this graph class, which is the adjacency matrix based one that we've talked about before, right there. Then we have this code called shortest tour to solve the traveling salesman problem. It takes in a graph, then it makes an array to hold the answer. So we get the tour sort of as a array of integers indicating which index of the node we're going to get. That just goes ahead and initializes them. And we start with them in order. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to however many nodes you have. Then we call this permute method to run through all of the possibilities. This does the actual work here. Then we print the tour out and print the total cost of it. So this permute method is kind of complicated. We don't need to go into it in a lot of detail, but it's based on this computation of all of the permutations, which is done recursively. So inside of this for loop, we are basically recursing on ourselves and this goes and rolls through all of the different possibilities. Again, this algorithm is just a little bit complicated, so I don't, I don't want to spend too much time. Uh, it's been kind of a long week already. 
on talking about how this works, but the interesting thing is that it goes through every single possibility of the graph. And then in main here, I've constructed the graph that we had as our example for this week. And I went ahead and called the shortest tour method on it so it can print it out. So let's see what it gives us. So if we run this program, it gives us A, B, F, C, E, D, and then back to A. So that was A, B, F, C, E, D, and then back to A. I'm not sure if that was the more efficient one of what we talked about or not, or if that's a new tour. But this algorithm, which just runs through all of the possibilities, which in this case, because there's the six nodes, is six factorial equals 720 possibilities. So because it goes through all of the n factorial possibilities, this algorithm is big O of n factorial, which is just dreadful for a big O to be. Uh, that's the highest one we've seen so far. So to illustrate that, here's a quick graph. We have, I've put down n from 1 to 24, then n squared, and then 2 to the n, and we've graphed that. And so you can see that 2 to the n, which is a really high complexity, completely dwarfs n and n squared, even when you get to 24. If I put this out even further, I mean, it would just rock it up and this would stay completely flat. So 2 to the n is really, really dreadful. That's a bad complexity. We've talked about a couple things already that have had 2 to the n complexity. One was the Towers of Hanoi problem, if you remember that. The other was the naive implementation of the Fibonacci number calculator. But now let me put an n factorial into this graph and see what happens. Well, here it is after I put the n factorial in, which is this yellow line. And as you can see, it is basically flat and it goes up so quickly that it's flat all the way until you get to 23. And then there's a barely perceptible jump and then an enormous jump to 24. And the other graphs are just completely flat below. So n factorial does to 2 to the n what 2 to the n did to n. And if you look at just the sort of raw chart here, I mean, the numbers just increase so, so quickly. So n factorial is completely unrealistic to run past even, you know, 15 to 20 input size, whereas 2 to the n, you can run, you know, up until you get to 30, I think is about where our Fibonacci number program started really slowing down. Maybe it was even up to 40, but with into the factorial, it's just, it's just so brutally, brutally slow to do anything. So we won't do this, but if I tried to run the traveling salesman solver program that we have on higher input sizes, like if we ran it on size 12, I don't believe it would finish, at least not anytime soon. We would be waiting a long time. And if we ran it on something with even a size of 25, we would be waiting like multiple lifetimes for this thing to finish. So the traveling salesman problem is in a class of problems that computer scientists call NP-complete. And you'll learn more about this if and when you take the class Computer Science 326, uh, the theory of computation. But the basic gist of it is that there is this class of problems that includes the traveling salesman problem, but it includes other problems as well. And they are basically so difficult to solve that we don't believe there is, even is an efficient solution to them. And moreover, if you were able to find a solution to one of these problems that's efficient, we would basically have a solution to all of them. And so most computer scientists believe that NP-complete problems are impossible to solve efficiently. And so what I mean by solving something efficiently is if we have big O of N to some constant, like if we have big O of N cubed, that's not great, but we're considering it to be efficient. Even if we have big O of N to the hundred, we're considering that to be efficient. Whereas ones that are inefficient are big O of N factorial or big O of two to the N or big O of you know anything else, 10 to the N or big O of n to the n, which I think is one you can see sometimes. So if it has a solution that's over here, even if it has a higher exponent than you'd like, we're saying that's an efficient algorithm. And if it has one that looks something like this, two to the n or any constant to the n, or this factorial thing like TSP, then we're saying that's inefficient. And these NP-complete problems, so far we only have algorithms for them that are extremely inefficient and we believe that no efficient problem exists. So the reason this is like an important thing to be aware of as a computer scientist 
is because there are problems that don't have efficient solutions and traveling salesman is one of them. So if you're working as a programmer and you're trying to solve some problem, you can't just assume that there is a good solution that you just need to think of. It's possible that there is no good solution. So like I said, traveling salesman is one of these. There are others as well. There's this problem called click. And what the click problem is asking is to find the biggest set of nodes in a graph that are all connected up together. So if we were using like the social media network graph as our example, this would be like finding a set of people that are like all friends with each other within the graph. And so I think this one has a click of size four. If we look at these four nodes here, I think they're all connected to each other, but we can't find a click of size five in this graph. There's also a click of size three, which is these three right here. So this problem of finding the biggest click, also NP complete, no efficient way to do it. One more sort of interesting one is the graph coloring problem. And the graph coloring problem wants to find a way to color the nodes of a graph in such a way that no two nodes of the same color are connected. And you wanna use as few colors as possible. So for example, I could make this one here red. That means these two can't be red because they're connected, but this one could be red and this one could be red. And now I don't think any of the other ones can be red, so we'll have to switch to a different color. And now I'll make some green nodes. This one can be green. Uh, this one can be green, but the other ones can't. So I can make this one here blue and this one here blue, but this one here has to be a fourth color, which I guess I can use purple for. And so in this case, I found a way to do it with four colors. Is there a way to do it with three colors? I'm not totally sure. Actually, I don't think there is because of this click of size four. So those problems are actually sort of related. But the graph coloring problem asks you to find the fewest colors that you could use to color in the graph. That's also NP complete. There's no efficient way to do that that we know of. These problems also, because graphs are so like widely applicable to lots of different areas, these problems can come up in sort of unexpected ways. So as a computer scientist, it's good to be aware that hey, there are problems that we might wanna solve that just don't have efficient solutions. And this is a big topic in Computer Science 326, but since it kind of came up here, I thought I'd talk about it a little bit as well, this idea of NP completeness. So that's all for this video on the traveling salesman problem. It's an interesting problem to look at, and it's obviously a really, really hard problem. We sort of went through the code example pretty quickly. I didn't want to explain uh, in full detail the, the permute method. If you want to, you can, you can look at it. And if you want to ask questions about it, you can. But I, I thought we had enough content this week, and so I didn't want to didn't want to go fully in detail into that when it's really not like an efficient algorithm anyway. So the notes page here has the link to the code for that if you want to take a look at it, and it also has you know an example of the graph of n factorial, so we can see just how dreadful that complexity is, and then some notes about NP complete problems as well. Also, thank you for watching these videos. Um, I've been meaning to say that. So if you're watching this, I really appreciate you like keeping up so well with the material. We're deep into the semester and this is a difficult topic and there's been a lot of videos this week that have been kind of long. So you know what? If you're watching this, email me and I'll give you some extra credit. I guess we'll need a code word. So, okay, so if you're watching this right now, email me hippopotamus, the word hippopotamus, and I will give you some extra credit for the class for being so great to watch all these videos and uh, be so, so diligent as a student. So yeah, do that and you'll get some extra credit. I will see you next time. Thanks.